Let's talk all too briefly about Ludwig Wittgenstein. That's how we're going to pronounce this sucker with the W's as V's as they do in Germany. Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um, 1889 to 1951, often thought of as, or sometimes thought of as the most important philosopher of the 20th century. That's kind of how he was sold to me when I got to grad school, actually, um, which made him seem awfully important. And he was. I don't know about the bet, the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, though. Um, all right. It's a hell of an amazing life, actually. Fascinating. Uh, you know, I recommend Ray Monk's biography of Wittgenstein if you're interested in a bunch of Wittgenstein. Um, he came from a, uh, very wealthy family in Vienna, uh, actually, uh, like an assimilated Jewish family, I guess we'd say, uh, or they say in, in Vienna, uh, which was an amazing, uh, capital of culture in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. You know, people like Freud were running around, uh, some great artists and so on. Um, it was a quite a problematic family. Three of his brothers ended up committing suicide. All the siblings, and there, there was a sister too, if I'm recalling correctly, uh, showed signs of genius. Um, they had a hard time dealing maybe with their failures to realize genius, but I mean, even Wittgenstein tortured himself that way, and no one has ever been welcomed as a genius by so many geniuses as Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um, I mean, like I say, did I say three of his brothers committed suicide? Wittgenstein often uh, contemplated suicide. Um, he was, uh, all right, so he, as a youth, he, uh, one of his brothers was a, um, a famous concert pianist who lost his left arm in the First World War. Uh, and then, you know, uh, was it Prokofiev who wrote him a symphony for the left hand or whatever? Um, and Wittgenstein also served in World War I. Uh, and uh, very distinctively, apparently, like, uh, uh, so, I mean, did, uh, with great distinction, let's say. Um, and he wrote this book, a wild and unbelievably problematic classic of 20th century philosophy, the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus in the trenches, uh, during World War One. It's inconceivable really. Uh, but there it is. Um, I guess this, this bristling title in Latin uh, I think it's actually based on Spinoza's Tractatus Theologico Politicus, or the other way around. Um, it just means a logical and philosophical treatise, essay or something, although it's hardly an essay. Um, and, you know, he arrived at Cambridge where Bertrand Russell uh, taught and was probably the most eminent logician in the world, with the possible exception of Frege, um, who, whom Wittgenstein also knew, and certainly Frege's philosophy, as with Russell's, as Frege says in the preface to the Tractatus, um, were highly influential on his views, although he also, uh, his views are incompatible in various ways at various stages with both of them, uh, with both Frege and Russell. Uh, he studied with Russell at Cambridge, but it was an awfully weird relationship because uh, as soon as Russell started talking to Wittgenstein, he started thinking Wittgenstein was so much smarter and so much of a better logician than he was. And he basically, Russell basically quit logic and philosophy of mathematics after that because he thought he could never compete with his own student, Wittgenstein. Um, I think that's a little sad, actually. Uh, but... Um, because Russell was an incomparable logician. All right, so um, it, this ended up being uh, his uh, PhD dissertation, 
And basically Russell just said like, all right, he's already, you know, way above our PhD levels or whatever. Like we'll just, we'll just give him a degree on the basis of this text. Um, and Wittgenstein moved in and out of Cambridge and the academic context, uh, more or less for the rest of his life. Uh, very ambivalent about being a university professor um, for various reasons. Uh, worked for as a school teacher for a while, kind of moved to a Norwegian fjord for a while. Um, and as the world awaited the next thunderclap, because the Tractatus was unbelievably influential, uh, as hard as it is to understand really what's going on uh, in some ways, uh, the entire movement known as logical positivism, uh, really, which we'll look at uh, in the form of A.J. Ayer, um, took up the banner of the Tractatus. And uh, one way or another, like I say, unbelievably influential on 20th century philosophy. Though, in some ways, the basic picture that it gives has been discredited. Wittgenstein himself came to regard it, I think, although this is controversial, as inadequate. Um, and, you know, so often we talk about the early and the late Wittgenstein, the basic uh, book of the late Wittgenstein being the philosophical investigations. And at a minimum, it takes a very, very different approach and tone than the Tractatus. Uh, so, and logical positivism, the movement to a significant extent based on the Tractatus um, was refuted and destroyed by uh, 20th century, by later 20th century analytic philosophers. So it's, this was more like a phase that we, you know, that maybe the discipline of philosophy of language uh, or even analytic philosophy as a whole moved through and got over to some extent, although we're, you know, people are often returning to the Tractatus. Um, he says in the preface, basically the last paragraph of the preface, I think that, you know, uh, and I think he definitely thought this, even while he expresses humility in various ways, um, that he had solved all the problems of philosophy. Primarily by showing that they do not arise at all. The problems of metaphysics the problems of ethics, the problems of aesthetics, in particular, those three, uh, as well as maybe religious talk and stuff like this. Um, these are just, and Wittgenstein thinks he's proved this more or less, are just nonsense, according to him. So one thing that happens in the Tractatus, I think, is the whole history of philosophy dissolves. It's, it, it all gets dismissed as nonsense. It, it, it's not even formulated in a way that is meaningful. The questions cannot even be formulated in a way that's meaningful. Like what is it, maybe even something like what is right action? Right? Much less uh, what sorts of things really exist in the universe as the, at the highest level? Are there forms? Are they all physical objects? You know, this, these kind of metaphysical questions you know, soul and body, things like this, Wittgenstein's, he's not addressing or solving them directly. He's dissolving them and saying that when you understand the language in which they're uh, framed, you'll see that they, there is no problem, actually. It's manufactured by the language in a certain way. And the logical positivists followed him in this and, you know, purported to collapse all philosophy into the only thing that philosophy can do is a kind of linguistic analysis, I think, by the time you're done with this little tendency. So let's talk about the Tractatus. Um, in some ways, it's a little tangential to the sorts of issues that we've seen in Frege and Russell, believe it or not, or it just seems to be in a sort of different discourse. Um, you know, he doesn't directly address like how is Frege's distinction of sense and reference sensible? Uh, should it be recast? Uh, you know, he doesn't directly deal with, say, Russell's theory of descriptions um, or even Russell's logic as framed in Principia Mathematica in any direct way. Um, what he d 
does do, and I, uh, it's a remarkable effort in this regard, is he tries to say what connects language to reality, which is Frege's question, uh, ultimately, I think. Uh, you know, how do expressions in a language secure a reference in the world? Um, but he's, but for Wittgenstein, this turns into a gigantic uh, kind of philosoph uh, linguistic uh, structure, uh, you know, that ultimately he thinks probably can answer all these questions, you know, uh, but gives a much broader framework for trying to address the relation of language to reality uh, and the limits of language in disclosing reality or reaching reality, which he thinks are severe. Um, you know, that's, that's why he said, well, wh whereof we cannot speak, thereof we must be silent. So let's look at this. I mean, the first, uh, I, I, we're not doing the whole, whole Tractatus. Um, the basic framework has, is sometimes called the picture theory of language, but that's an inadequate characterization of it, but it does uh, show something about this. So he uses propositions in our parlance which again appear to be abstract objects that many sentences could have in common if they make the same assertion or have the same empirical consequences, for example. But propositions are his basic um, linguistic unit. All right. And what he says is that in the world, I mean, just cutting to the chase in the simplest way, in the world, the world consists of facts. The world is everything that is the case, one, one. Proposition one, you know, these are all, you know, so 1.1 will be proposition 1.1 will be elucidating one and 1.11 will be elucidating 1.1. Right. Uh, and then we'll go on to 1.12. All right. And there are seven num uh, enumerated sections systematically number to show actually show I think among other things the logical relations between that he thinks exist between these the claims that he's making there's not a lot of argument in the tractatus basically just a series of assertions but they are very compelling assertions uh, or at least many philosophers thought so at the time uh, the world is everything that is the case is one uh, the world is the totality of facts he says to elucidate that the world consists of facts. Now, what is a fact? Oh, Lord, now we're in trouble. All right. Like that's that's one of the big issues. <laughs> what the hell is a fact? Is it a juxtaposition? Uh, it's a it's a it is in itself a non linguistic item. Maybe a juxtaposition of physical objects in the world. Or perhaps it can be represented in a proposition that discloses the relations between things in the world. Like, uh, you know, this chair is to the left of that chair. This chair is to the left of that chair. Right. Now, the chairs in space are the fact, the situation. What is the case? Right. Uh, and the proposition is, you know, that this chair is to the left of that chair. Wittgenstein says that this proposition represents that state of affairs in virtue of being a picture of it. The proposition is a picture, a, a proposition is a picture of a fact, or at least an atomic proposition, a basic proposition, the minimal size proposition is a picture of a basic fact. So he wants to understand linguistic reference by analogy to pictorial representation. He thinks of a sentence as a kind of picture of reality. Um, and a sentence will be true uh, if it's, or a proposition will be true if it's isomorphic 
with the fact that it represents. If it shares a form with the fact that it represents. Now, maybe this form that these two things share is not a pictorial form. You know, they're not both yellow, the proposition and the chair, all right? Uh, because the proposition has no color. Um, the, the picturing relation in language is somehow about logical form. And the way that the logical form of a proposition maps the structure of the external fact. These are very vague declarations and they're hard as hell to pay off on. He does take some cracks at it though too. Um, and one thing about that is at least it's a very clear direct way. Well, it's a, it's a very direct way to try to address this question of, of the overall relation of language to reality. Language is a picture of reality. And that's not a crazy, it's kind of thing people might have been saying before that, although not working it out like this in an incredibly systematic, logical fashion. Um, okay, so that's the basic picture, uh, picture theory of language. Um, okay. And we build up from depictions of atomic facts, what he calls atomic or like minimal facts. Now, I mean, not all, I, it's interesting, and I don't think he answers this directly I, I, uh, in the book exactly. Some facts do appear to be like this chair is to the left of that chair. Other facts are maybe this chair is gray. All right. Now, is that just a juxtaposition of physical objects in space? Or is it, or is it a um, pairing of an object with a property that is grayness? So one question is whether facts are just should be looked at as directly as situations in the physical world, or whether we have to appeal to something about like objects in that world having properties A, B, and C. That's the way a lot of philosophers represent a fact, like just, you know, F A, uh, you know, A is F, A, an object, a thing is F, uh, quality. You know, maybe that is the minimal structure of a external fact. Although maybe we're just kind of confused by the grammar of Western languages or something on that a little bit too. Finding a subject predicate form everywhere in the damn world and every single object and every single fact. Um, all right. Um, and every statement about complexes, he says, this is 2.0201, uh, it's on page three. Every statement about complexes, like, uh, you know, complex situations, like, you know, uh, maybe the economy is growing or the economy is shrinking uh, can be analyzed into a statement about their constituent parts and into those propositions which completely describe the complexes. This is a program known as logical atomism. Extremely complex and generalized propositions uh, finally boiled down at least as far as working with them in logic is concerned to elementary propositions, or basic propositions, atomic propositions, like the minimum possible proposition. Maybe it's A is F, you know. Um, and then we build up larger, uh, more complex propositions from those, but the meaning of any proposition, no matter how general and no matter how complex, can be reduced or understood in terms of the atomic facts that it uh, that are in it or that are relevant to it. So if I say the economy is shrinking, you know, I mean like a set of a vast set of atomic facts, like you know, Mike lost his job and Jenny lost her job, and you know, uh, the Federal Reserve chair did, you know, etc. You know what I mean? Um, so we're going to analyze everything into this kind of simple facts, which get a direct, which at least potentially get a direct depiction in a proposition. 
Um, okay. So let's look at some of, okay, so just a couple of propositions here. This is 2.04. The totality of existent atomic facts is the world. The totality of existing atomic facts is the world. The world, which is all we can talk about actually, consists of ultimately of the atomic facts of it, reduces to the atomic facts of it. Uh, or 2.06, the existence and non-existence of atomic facts is the reality, is reality. The existence or non-existence of atomic facts. Um, we make ourselves pictures of facts. That's 2.1. We make ourselves pictures of facts. And those are the propositions. The picture presents the facts in logical space. You can do things like draw inferences from them and stuff like this. Do you see what I mean? The fact itself just sits there in the world being gray or whatever, the chair being gray. Uh, but to make a picture of it as a, to make a proposition about it, you are presenting it in a logical space. It's not it's not only the raw relation of the proposition to what it represents. It's the relation of propositions to one another too. Like what you can you infer from this proposition? What could you infer this proposition from? What are the log what is the logical structure of this proposition? Uh, and so on. Um, okay, the picture presents the facts in logical space. The existence or non-existence and non-existence of atomic facts. The picture is a model of reality. That's an interesting thing to say. And now we're talking about computer models of reality and so on. Um, to the objects in, in the fact correspond the picture, in the picture, the elements of the picture. The elements of the fact, like the chair here and the chair there, this chair is the left of that one, correspond uh, to the elements of the picture, like this chair corresponds to the phrase this chair in my use right now, and that one uh, to my fr phrase that chair. And I'm creating, when I say this chair is to the left of that chair, I create a isomorphic picture in logical space, enabling inference and such, uh, of the fact before me or the fact that I'm trying to represent. Um, that the elements of the picture are combined with one another in a def definite way represents that the things are so combined with one another in the world. Um, this connection of the elements of the picture is called its structure and the possibility of the structure is called the form of representation of this picture. Um, In order, he says, this is 2.16, in order to be a picture, a fact must have something in common. Uh, okay, wait a second. In, the, in order for the picture to be a picture of a fact, in order to be a picture, a fact must have something in common with what it pictures. Is there a typo in that? All right, anyway, uh, so there must be a common element in uh, the proposition that represents or pictures the fact and the fact itself. And I mean, I'm sort of vaguely gesturing at what this common element is in terms of isomorphism or having the same form. Um, okay. The picture agrees with reality or not, he says, 2.21 on page five. The picture agrees with reality or not. It is right or wrong true or false. Now that's kind of interesting because actually pictures are more or less accurate. I don't think pictures are bivalent in quite, in quite this way. There's not one accurate depiction of uh, any particular situation. I mean, uh, so pictorial accuracy is a matter of degree. But 
logic is truth is bivalent. Um, this is an example, I think, of one of many problems that slipped through the cracks in the Tractatus. Um, okay. And I mean, the idea is that you're, in a way, you're going to build the, a logical structure of the universe. Um, and that was actually the, the title of a uh, book by Rudolf Carnap, famous book by Rudolf Carnap, that was actually based on, was very much based on the Tractatus way of thinking. Um, if you want to understand what the world is, if you want to characterize the word world fully, uh, you just enumerate every proposition, every possible factual assertion about the world. And in the world, either that assertion or its negation will be true. Uh, so in principle, you could describe the world fully uh, in terms of its atomic facts, maybe reduce every higher level meaningful sentence to a uh, sentence about atomic facts. Um, okay. So the specification of all true elementary propositions describes the world completely. The world is described by the specification of all um, elementary propositions. That is propositions represent atomic facts, plus the specification, which of them are true and which are false. If you, if you had all the atomic propositions and you assign each of them a truth value, you would have described an entire world. Um, and, you know, so, so, and we're gonna build these wider descriptions from the, atomic, uh, from the atomic facts. And, you know, he describes how we do this in a logical form or a logical language. Uh, and I think he invented the truth table technique so if you've had logic, you've had Wittgenstein, uh, he runs some truth tables on page seven. And what he's saying is like, you know, a proposition like this, if P then Q is purely a function of the truth values of P and Q. And we can show this. Okay, so this is a compound proposition and these are atomic propositions in Wittgenstein's sense, All right? If the chair is gray, then it's not yellow, okay? The chair is gray and the chair is not yellow are atomic facts. And then we can generate much more complex characterizations of facts or the world as a whole even or something like this. Maybe we can't do that actually for Wittgenstein, uh, but much wider by uh, just describing all the truth possibilities that we've got here. Um, okay, so, you know, P could be true or P could be false, but we're gonna need four lines to do the truth table, of course, in this case. Um, Um, you probably remember this from logic class. Uh, I think you all had logic. Um, so, you know, if P is Q and true is, and Q is true, then if P then Q is true. If P is true and Q is false, it's false, true otherwise. So what he's showing when he does truth tables, he thinks, I think, is how we build a world from atomic propositions plus logical connections or connectives even, uh, logical relations between these propositions. Okay. All right. Brilliant, interesting stuff, even if also maddeningly vague and elusive in some ways, even though the presentation is so seemingly precise. All right. Um, now, what he does in the course of the book, and we just come back at the end, I'm sorry, uh, is that he tries, one thing he tries to show is that all atomic propositions are empirical propositions. I, I mean, he defines them this way, like they're pro propositions about the world, okay? Um, 
so what are we going to do with propositions that are not like sort of don't seem to reduce to flat factual statements about empirical reality? So what will we do with ethics, for instance, or all value statements? Right. That I mean, murder is wrong is definitely not some kind of atomic fact. And it's definitely not the kind of fact that a scientist could discover in a lab murder is wrong. OK. And actually, Wittgenstein has this in mind that all atomic facts are empirical, physical situations. All right. Um, so then he starts to say that all we can meaningfully express are pictures of atomic facts and strings of them, like logically uh, articulated combinations, you know, negations, conditionals, conditionals that consist of conditionals, uh, conditionals that consist, uh, you know, where the antecedent and the consequent are disjunctions, etc. Uh, but right at the heart are these atomic facts, which are empirical, worldly facts. And something like murder is wrong, or even that act was wrong because it was murder, he thinks are not atomic facts of this kind and are not compound facts of this kind that could be drawn out of atomic facts. And so he concludes they cannot be represented in language. Ethics cannot be said at all. No ethical claim can appear coherently in language. Later, philosophers just put this by saying like all of ethics, all of aesthetics, all of uh, uh, metaphysics and much else besides it's just nonsense. It's just like gobbledygook. It's just like going, right? Wittgenstein isn't quite there actually, uh, because he has this kind of mystical thing where what's most important is what cannot be said or what can only be shown, right? Now, how we should interpret this is a famous problem. Um, he says, uh, this is what, 6.41, if there is a value, which is of value, it must lie outside all happening and being so, like outside the empirically detectable universe, uh, for all happening and being so is accidental and ethical claims are supposed to be necessary in some way. Um, so it must lie outside the world. The fact that an ethical claim mirrors or uh, represents must lie outside the world. But that just means that there can be no ethical propositions by, there can be no ethical propositions by Wittgenstein's definition of proposition. There can be no ethical facts. That's why there can be no ethical propositions because there can be no ethical facts. Um, oh, I mean, so he says things like, uh, it is clear that ethics cannot be expressed. Remind Jim Sias of this if you take uh, the ethics class here or whatever, or, uh, Amy McKiernan. Uh, it's clear that ethics cannot be expressed. It can be felt or something, maybe, uh, or something, maybe not. But uh, it can't be expressed. And so that whole history of ethics, you know, you just read like, you know, where you started with Plato and Aristotle, you know, you did Spinoza's ethics. I don't know. You did uh, utilitarianism, deontology, Kant, Mill. There's not a single meaningful proposition in that whole literature, probably, unless there's some some moment where they go like, you know, where John Stuart Mill says, my friend Mike was bouncing a ball or something. That sounds like a, uh, okay, but. Um, <clears throat> um,
So at 6.5, he says, page nine, for an answer which cannot be expressed, the question too cannot be expressed. The riddle does not exist. You know, what is moral goodness or what should I do? What should I do? That riddle does not exist, okay? It's not that we can't answer it. It's that we shouldn't answer it. I mean, we, we, it's, it's not answerable and we shouldn't try. We just, you know, and, and one thing we're doing here is just deleting whole swaths of philosophy and a bunch of other stuff too. Uh, even though maybe we're going to bring it back in, in, in the phase of mystical nonverbal experience, if there is such a thing for Wittgenstein. Um, the real does not exist. If the question can be put at all, then it can also be answered. All the basic questions of philosophy, except some questions like these about linguistic meaning and so on, uh, are, uh, cannot be answered and so cannot be asked, have never been asked. They're unaskable questions because the forms of words that you use uh, to ask the questions are meaningless, do not have meaning in the sense that Wittgenstein says uh, you know that uh, you know that uh, expression means um we feel at 6.52 we feel that even if all possible scientific questions can be answered the problems of life like the problems of ethics or aesthetics for example still have not been touched at all or the problem you know does god exist and how shall i live of course that there is then no question left and just this is the answer that's how we answer philosophical questions. The question does not exist. People found this incredibly powerful and started just tearing apart the history of philosophy and not only of philosophy uh, with these techniques, somewhat prematurely in my opinion. Um, the right method, okay, the, the inexpressible, he says, shows itself. It's the mystical ethics, aesthetics, and metaphysics, among other things. Uh, the right method of philosophy would be this, to say nothing except what can be said, the propositions of natural science. That is, the propositions of natural science, those can be said. Those refer to facts, i.e. something that has nothing to do with philosophy. And then always, when someone else wished to say something metaphysical, to demonstrate to him that he had given no meaning to certain signs in his propositions. Okay, so, you know, rest content with natural science. That's what human knowledge is. And when someone starts giving you metaphysics or philosophical or ethical claims, you just go like, uh, just to, the only response of a real philosopher in this sense would be to demonstrate to him that he had given no meaning to his terms and hence hadn't said anything or asked anything. Um, now, that raises the amazing question of what the uh, what all these claims in the Tractatus are doing. Like he is making claims about ethics and values and so on, which he just said cannot be asked. You know, so like, all right, so uh, I say, what is goodness? And you go like, uh, you know, well, that question, you know, yields to linguistic analysis that shows it's nonsense. But okay, but then we are talking about that question right there. Even as Wittgenstein has presented the idea that all these things are pseudo questions that have to disappear, he is violating his own standards because he's talking about them too. And they cannot be spoken. They cannot be talked about at all on his view. Right? So then he says this, uh, this is, one of the most famous passages in 20th century philosophy. It's, a, it's, it's kind of an amazing thing. 6.54, my propositions are elucidatory in this way. They're elucidating stuff. He who understands me, the ones that I've, where I've apparently violated my own standards of meaning, he who understands me finally recognizes them as senseless. He who understands this book will recognize that the book up until now has been senseless because it's doing philosophy. 
I just wrote a census book by my own theory. Um, when the reader has climbed out of metaphysics and ethics and all this through these through this book that you've read so far on them on climbed out on my propositions that I've just given all these you know five point three point six seven eight and you know um, when he's climbed out through them on them over them. He must, so to speak, throw away the ladder after he has climbed it. Like I had to discuss these things to show you that they don't make any sense, to show you that they're meaningless. My own discourse has been meaningless insofar as it's been philosophy at all, or insofar as it's engaged in philosophy at all. But what I'm trying to do is give you a ladder that you can climb up to the point of making sense and then the ladder can be kicked away. You can forget about all these pseudo propositions that I used to bring you here. That's an amazing technique in philosophy. Have you ever seen that? Like, uh, I just wrote a senseless book, but it might help you. Okay. Um, and then the famous end, whereof we cannot speak, thereof we must be silent. And then he lapses into silence and actually never actually published another book. All right. Uh, so let's not talk about it, man, because we can't talk about it, all right? And whereof we cannot speak, thereof we must be silent. All right, that's a little Wittgenstein. And we'll also do a chunk of the investigations and talk about a little bit about the relation of early and late Wittgenstein later in the semester.